Well, I think you're, let me unmute you. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, there you go. Okay, can I take it that music is gonna be on in the, whole, in the background the whole time? <laughs> um, it might be you. Okay, let me, oh yeah, it was me. <laughs> you can share though, we like music. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even realize that. So how's everyone doing today? <clears throat> I know it uh, may be the end of a long day and people are ready for it to be over. So I won't take up tons of your time, but I do want to uh, say it's a pleasure to be here with you all this evening. And uh, just to give you just a high level intro to myself, uh, my name is Brian Bridges. I'm the Secretary of Higher Education in New Jersey. And um, I have uh, come along this path of, through higher education to where I am today. You know, I think about um, the uh, students that uh, CDI works with, and it, you're probably a similar student profile to myself. I had ability to uh, go to college and succeed and do well, but I needed, I wish I had a CDI because I needed some mentorship. I didn't have, you know, I was the first person in my family to graduate from high school, let alone college. And so my family wanted to be supportive, just didn't really know what to do or how to support me. And so the idea of having uh, savvy and strong mentors in my life is one that uh, I wish I had, but I did have a couple. And one was the key in helping me to uh, end up achieving what I was able, what I've been able to achieve in my life. So with that, I want to, um, share my screen and in that can you see my screen now okay let me do the presentation okay so um <clears throat> I've done my intro. And just to give you a sense of what the agenda will be, I'm not gonna talk at you the whole time. I want you, I wanna throw out some questions to ask you that I want people to respond to. And I um, wanna really talk about a few things. One, start with the power of soft skills. How many of you have heard about, how many of you are aware of what soft skills are? And I can't see everyone, but I'm assuming somebody has their hands up. And so soft skills, I'll go into a little more detail about that and then talk about some career readiness competencies that it would be good for all of you to be aware of as you uh, look to go to college and uh, <clears throat> earn degrees that put you on a, on a different kind of path. And then I uh, want to talk a little bit about how you can leverage a growth mindset and uh, to cultivate those soft skills and prepare for a career and lifelong uh, success. So with that, uh, soft skills. I want to start by just talking about that at a very, very high level. Um, since I couldn't see everyone's hands, I didn't know if anyone wanted to take a stab at uh, what soft skills are, but since the definition is here in front of you now, I'll go ahead and share that. Soft skills, they're non-technical interpersonal and behavioral skills that help foster relationships and career growth. And there's a, there's a more complex definition, but uh, basically, uh, people often refer to hard skills as the thinking kinds of things that you have to do. The, the, the cognitive, those are called cognitive skills. These used to be called non-cognitive skills, but people are calling them soft skills often. Um, you know, when you have to do technical analysis, that's a hard skill. When you have to do technical problem solving, that's a hard skill. Soft skills are the things like communication, critical thinking leadership and management, they're intangible. They're not so easy to measure. So you can measure someone's quote unquote aptitude on math, on English by giving them a test. Um, it's harder to measure these soft skills. You can uh, measure whether or not someone has effective communication skills and what have you. But the, the range of these skills are a little more difficult to put your finger on. And so, uh, there are a few examples here, adaptability, initiative, as someone who 
as a staff that I oversee now, I know that I love people who take initiative, people who see that something needs to be done and they go about doing it. I don't have to tell them every little thing, hey, can you pick up that, that thing? Hey, can you do that report? Hey, can you check that box today? But people who can do that without me having to tell them every single time is a skill that I love. Adaptability, people who understand that if you, yes, we might have a plan of how we plan on approaching this particular issue, but things change. And sometimes we have to be able to adapt and shift with those changes. And uh, those who are, are locked into a particular way of thinking, who have, and we'll talk a little bit about that later when we talk about growth mindset. Um, if you have a fixed mindset, that's just really difficult that to deal with. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about how you can cultivate these soft skills as well. And uh, one of the ways, might anyone have any ideas about how we cultivate skills like communication, critical thinking, leadership and management, um, adaptability and initiative as some examples? Um, doing things like working in groups and other people, maybe joining clubs, like that. That's a good one, Anaya. Is it Anaya? Yes, yes. Anaya. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yes. Anyone else have any examples? Um, about adaptability, what is uh, like an example of that skill, like adaptability? Is that like um, if you from another country, like you're a foreigner and then you came here you adapt to the culture. Is that also count as adaptability? Or is this more like how do you deal with other people like in difficult situation? Yeah, well, adaptability is just how you deal with change more than anything else. And whether or not you can, whether or not you can change and adapt to different situations. So actually that's probably a really good experience or a good example of someone coming from another country, different culture, different language, different set of social norms. And then when you're able to adapt, that shows some soft skill on your part that is um, an example of what you need to be able to do in work as well, because you might shift careers at one point and be able to have to adapt. So that's a, that's a really good example. Uh, anyone else? So I'll end the suspense um, and provide some examples about how you can uh, cultivate your soft skills. You can uh, cultivate soft skills in a number of ways. Uh, one is through um, regular feedback from uh, your friends, mentors, supervisors. You know, don't be afraid to give feedback about your performance. Don't be afraid to have someone give you, potentially tell you something that you don't want to hear because that often prompts the greatest amount of growth. When you hear something that's difficult to hear about your performance, you think you are hot stuff. You just knocked it out of the park and someone tells you, someone that you respect, because now we all know that there are haters out there who just don't want to give you, and we'll talk about them a little bit too, but someone that you respect who's objective, uh, accept that feedback from them because that can help you change, adapt, and grow. Um, practice, you know, practice your communication skills. Practice uh, some adaptability by disrupting your norms. Uh, and that's one down here. So that's tied to this disrupting one's norms. Don't do the same thing all the time. Don't approach every task responsibility in the same way because that can help make uh, some of those uh, neural connections that you might not otherwise make when you get into this fixed mindset of doing things one way and one way only all the time. So disrupt your norms, practice, and um, seek out some mentorship. You know, someone who can coach you and show, the students, show you important soft skills, um, that increases the likelihood that you'll develop those soft skills. So seek out strong mentors, 
Now, I, I will say my little piece on mentorship, hopefully I'm not going against CDI um, mantra here. Uh, I believe that organic mentors are the best mentors. You know, we can appoint mentors because I've been in programs. I've been a mentor before. Now I've mentored people often and people ask me for advice. And those are the people that look up to me, consider me a mentor, that we have a good working relationship and I feel like they actually get something out of it. I've been in mentoring programs where I've been assigned to be a mentor and have not connected with those individuals. And, um, and I just realized to me, organic mentoring where you connect with somebody and can uh, distill knowledge and wisdom from them based on the relationship you already have, are those are the most fulfilling mentoring relationships more so than the um, those that are assigned. Now, you could have a great assigned mentor. There's some people better than, than that at that than me. So I don't want to knock assigned mentorship at all. But for me, the organic mentors are the ones that are the best, uh, provide the best experience. So now that you know a little bit more about these soft skills and how to cultivate them, um, can anyone provide me with an example of you putting your soft skills into action? Um, I've always like been told that I'm very assertive and do a lot of self-advocacy. So I've kind of learned that about myself. And now I'm a um, second year peer mentor to um, incoming first year college students at my college. Okay, great. And great, Caroline. Yes, that's one of the um, people will often say that uh, one of the soft skills that isn't on here is uh, self-efficacy. And um, that's one of those that, you know, it's hard to teach. It's hard to measure, you know, how um, much agency, self-agency you exhibit for yourself. Um, but that's one of those, it goes back to the initiative uh, bullet that I had on the prior slide that individuals who can take their own initiative, demonstrate agency for themselves. Uh, that's one of those soft skills that it's hard. You don't put that in a book. It's something that can be cultivated through practice, feedback, mentorship, um, and disrupting your norm. So yes, great example. Anyone else want to share? You know, we can, uh, I used to be a, a faculty member at George Washington University and you used to do this exercise occasion where I would just uh, let dead silence sit in the class for like two minutes. Uh, and people would often feel like, okay, I gotta say something. And so I don't wanna get there, but just throw out these uh, questions and there'll be more questions later on in the presentation. So with that, I'll go into the next slide to talk about why these soft skills are important. Um, because more and more, and I hear this all the time in my current role with the employer community who um, in the workforce, they will say, your colleges aren't doing enough to prepare students for our work um, or to be work ready on day one. Um, employers want um, workers who contribute fully on the first day that they're on the job. And one of the skills, some of the skills that employers are asking for more and more every day are soft skills. Even in, in technical roles like engineering um, and computer science, more and more of those employers are asking for, uh, yes, I want somebody who can code and who can, um, you know, develop new programs and what have you, but I need them to be able to play well with others. I need them to be able to communicate effectively with their teammates. Um, and so NACE, the National Association of Colleges and Employers, have come up with these eight career readiness competencies. And so this is a key for you as you navigate your educational pathway to think about how do you develop these competencies. Um, and this career readiness will just serve you well 
as you go out into the job market. And so they, I mean, you're all smart, you can read, so I'm not gonna go through all of them, but be very intentional, for instance, about your career and self-development. So cultivating your soft skills so that you can be the best candidate possible. Practicing interview skills, for instance. And even uh, at, my, at my stage of my career, um, you know, I've told people where I'm recommending folks now to be college presidents and what have you, I've said, I just said to someone last week, don't, you know, this job might not be one that you're interested in, but don't shy away from it because it could give you practice for when the right opportunity comes along. So I think they would be a good candidate, would probably get to the final stage. And if you're not interested, you're not interested, but you leverage this opportunity as a, an opportunity to practice. So that career and self-development is key. Um, and how you have to be intentional about that. Intentional, don't assume, and this is part of the fixed mindset that we'll talk about in a little bit. Don't assume that just because you're smart and you work hard, that your career will come to you. You know, I think a lot of students, especially college students, used to especially have this mindset that, oh, if I do well, if I get all A's in college and get my degree, a job is gonna be waiting on me. No, that's not gonna be the case. So there are some things that you have to be intentional about in developing yourself to prepare for your career and developing and preparing for that career, developing yourself and your career readiness as well. Communication. I don't need to talk about that. You got to be able to effectively communicate. Uh, critical thinking is the number one soft skill that employers are looking for. They want workers who couple that with the uh, initiative thing that I talked about who can sit down, examine a complex problem and come up with out of the box thinking and approaches to address the issue. So critical thing, and that's one of those really amorphous ones that are, that's difficult to try to cultivate. But you know, once again, disrupt your norms, think outside of the box. And there are little exercises that you can do to help cultivate your critical thinking skills. But it's one of those that you definitely have to put some effort and work into. Um, equity and inclusion piece uh, goes without saying that, and especially now in today's society, you not only have to be mindful about uh, being able to cultivate and interact with different uh, people from different backgrounds, but a lot of companies now are even going to the place where they're saying, you need to know how to be an anti-racist and cultivate and, and, uh, and instill anti-racist behavior in your colleagues and lead by example. So these are just some of the leadership professionalism. These are just some of the, um, the career readiness competencies that NACE outlined, uh, being able to manage technology. You all know, you're probably way better at technology than I am. Um, technology is only going to become more central to our daily lives. And so as we navigate the technological world in which we live, you have to be able to um, do that with skill and a deft and an understanding of how um, it has implications for your career work. Any questions about, about these competencies? Do they sound outside of the box? Do, does anyone else have any competencies they want to add? I did want to jump in and say, um, I won't say when I graduated college, it hasn't been too long, but you know, um, it's just interesting to hear that like, and, and I, I think the college students can speak to this, that you don't hear about the specific competencies within the classroom, right? Like, and I think getting to that point, right? Like they teach you about like, yes, getting A's in classes and computer science and English and reading and writing. Um, but it's just so fascinating how we don't bring these up enough. I feel. Thank you, Wendy. I, I agree totally that, um, you know, colleges are struggling with this because they talk about, it's become more of a mantra over the last decade, probably decade to 15 years or so, more and more colleges are struggling with how to cultivate these skills in students, especially because the employer community is asking for them more and more. Um, you know, it's, it's contributed to the rise of leadership programs on campus. For students. 
critical thinking is one that every college will tell you, if you look at their mission statement or what they do, they will all say in some language on their flowery language on their website that they cultivate critical thinking skills. Um, but it's hard to measure, one. And two, a lot of places do it better than others. And I think that a lot of places, a lot of colleges and universities rely on students who already had critical thinking skills in place as a good measure for their effectiveness. <clears throat> so you're right, communication skills, all these things, colleges and universities try to do these things in, it's kind of like white noise when you're on a campus. So yeah, there's a career center and the career center will tell you these things, but you gotta be intentional about taking advantage of it. There's a leadership program, a leadership development program, but you've gotta be intentional about taking part in it. There, yes, in your curriculum, you're supposed to be getting critical thinking skills. But you know, if you're not very intentional about trying to pull out in the critical thinking skills in each class, because most of your syllabi, for those of you in college, most of your syllabi is going to have something about critical thinking on it. And but you have to be intentional about making sure that okay, where where am I getting my critical thinking skills in this course? So these things, they're communication courses, of course. Every campus now has a diversity, equity, and inclusion program or office. Um, business programs, for instance, students in business, and I'm sure that there's some business students on the line. Uh, business builds their curriculum around teamwork. Hence, why when you're in a capstone business course, you have to do this team, these team projects and what have you. So all these things are in the background, but you have to be very intentional about distilling everything you can from these competencies to make sure that you're getting the maximum effort. So I wanna talk a little bit about this idea of fixed versus growth mindset. Anyone read Carol Dweck? I don't expect any of you to say that you've read Carol Dweck. That's just something I threw out there to see if um, you all were listening. But um, Carol Dweck is the leader. She's a faculty member at Stanford. Um, <clears throat> who about 20, actually probably like 30 years ago now, in, uh, came up with this concept about growth mindset. And so she's written books. There's a book called Mindset um, about how a person's mindset sets the stage for their goals. She's a psychologist. And so she's become uh, famous over this work. And um, you know, there's a difference. People with a fixed mindset is, and this is really key for young people. Um, when you have a fixed mindset, you have certain beliefs about um, intelligence and your lot in life. You're probably one of those people that believe that people are just, they're born with a certain set of potential and that's all they're gonna, they're gonna live. Someone with a growth mindset uh, believes that intelligence and ability can be developed and they seek out chances to try to cultivate that mindset. Um, and people with a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset is often kind of a plateau that people with a fixed mindset um, might encounter as far as their career outcomes. But with a growth mindset, they can reach higher achievement levels. And so there's a graphic that I found, if I can, um, since I'm still sharing my screen, and if I can get out of this show, there's a graphic that I found online that's a perfect uh, synopsis of this. So this is uh, work from Carol Dweck. Are you all still seeing my screen? No, I think you have to reshare the- Oh, okay, the, new share. Internet okay. screen. Okay. We still see your PowerPoint, yeah. Okay. Do you all see a different screen now? Yep, there you go. Okay. So this is from Carol Dweck's, her two mindsets, um, I think from her first book that she's refined further. And um, this gives you a sense of um, the difference between a growth mindset, the fixed mindset and a growth mindset. So those with the fixed mindset, for instance, believe that intelligence is static. That is just, you're just as intelligent as you're gonna be. You're, you're, you're born, you've got a potential, maybe you'll get to, an IQ where you focus on a number, 
you might get to be 110 IQ and that's it. You can't get any better. Um, where, and this leads to a desire to look smart over uh, a desire to learn. And people with a growth mindset believe that intelligence can be developed. Everyone has the possibility to become smarter, who can change their, their lives and their place in life if they work hard and uh, work to cultivate uh, their mindset. So the fixed mindset leads to desire to look smart. The growth mindset leads to desire to learn. And both of them have different tendencies. So fixed mind, those with fixed mindsets, they have a tendency to avoid challenges. Whereas those with a growth mindset tend to embrace challenges because this is an opportunity for them to grow. Um, those with a fixed mindset, when they encounter an obstacle, they might give up really easily. With the growth mindset, they see this, they persist in the face of those face setbacks because they see this as an opportunity to grow, learn something and become a better and stronger individual. Um, the fixed mindset individuals, they see effort as, why am I working so hard? Because it's not gonna make a difference. If you hear someone say something like that, that's a fixed mindset. Um, whereas the growth mindset individuals see effort as a path to mastery. You can't become a master until you um, have worked at something really hard. I tell my daughters who are uh, taking tennis now, one doesn't want to do the, do the work. She wants to be like Serena. And I said, well, how do you think Serena got as good as she did got? Because she saw, she worked at it. She didn't let the obstacles overcome her. She overcame the obstacles. And she saw her effort as a path to mastery. Um, criticism, fixed mindset individuals, uh, ignore useful negative feedback, like I said, from the right people. Um, whereas the growth mindset individuals, they hear feedback, they hear criticism, and they say, okay, all right, I might not like that. I might not like hearing that about myself, but I'm going to use that to learn. And I'm going to become better as a result. And the fixed mindset individuals see other their peers and their friends being successful, and they're threatened by that. However, the growth mindset individuals say, okay, okay, I see what Isabel is doing. I want to be like her. Okay, I saw how she did that to get there. I'm going to learn from that, and I'm going to be. I'm going to employ some of those same lessons to uh, get to where she is, or even further. And so, as a result, the growth mindset individuals may plateau early in life. You know, and I always often think about it. Some of you might know. Hopefully, I'm not. I don't think I'm stepping on anybody's toes because y'all are in college. But you know, there are some people. There are some people who high school is like the peak of their lives. You know, those, those kids who are really, really cool in high school. And that's like the highest point of life for them. And everything else is just, they cut their lives kind of plateau. But then there are others who have a growth mindset who reach, who continuously reach higher levels of achievement. Um, and all of this gives them a greater sense of free will. So I just wanted to share that um, graphic with you because I think it does a, it's a good example of um, the difference between the uh, growth and um, the growth and fixed mindset. So let me go back to my screen. Okay. And so how do we foster a growth mindset? Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we can do is to um, make sure that we are creating an environment where students and individuals understand that intelligence is not something that is fixed. That if you put forth the work and the effort and try to learn from others, um, and uh, don't become uh, blocked by obstacles that you can improve, strengthen your intelligence and become stronger in your cognitive abilities. Um, CDI, I think also helps to create an environment supportive of growth. And that is key. Uh, Carol Dweck tells a, a, an anecdote where she saw there's a high school in Chicago where if students don't reach a certain grade, they don't get an F, they don't get a D, their grade is not yet. 
Not Yet. And she even has a TED Talk. You can look it up. Carol Dweck, TED Talk on Not Yet. It, um, and then she talks about how that's part of the environment for supportive growth. Not that these students are failing. You don't want to tell them that they're just failures, but that they're just not there yet. And with the right kind of encouragement and growth and support, they can actually get to where everyone else is or get to where others are. Uh, shift from praising performance to praising effort and process. I share this with my daughters all the time. Don't just say, oh, you, that's so, you're so smart. You're so smart. You're such a smart person. You're such a smart girl. No, I praise their effort. Great effort. I appreciate your effort. Keep trying, keep trying. And this is just shifting the mindset from thinking that they have to be smart to embracing effort. And um, encourage challenging work to build confidence. And um, you know, I think that uh, too often, many of us wanna take the easy way out and don't realize that um, the challenging work is an opportunity for growth. So with that, I was gonna ask a question about who feels, who has employed a growth mindset? If anyone is willing, I don't wanna to try to call anybody out, but if anyone is willing to share a growth mindset story that you might have, I would love to, and I'm sure that everyone would love to hear it. Let me take the screen down. I know we're about at time, Isabel. We got, like, we got like five more minutes. So whoever wants to share, I think that'd be great. No judgment zone, I'll say that. <laughs> okay, Mohammed, I appreciate that note. So let me ask a different question then. Has any, can anyone say that they've seen the growth mindset in action? That they know friends, family members, mentors that they consider a, an example of growth mindset? Um, I think like now going into like college, the transition was hard um, just because, you know, being first generation, you know, college student, like you don't really have, um, you know, your parents to lean on, even though like CDI is great and like it's very supportive. <laughs> Sometimes you're like, man, I wish like, you know, I could go to my parents or I wish I could have someone that, you know, could relate to. Um, but I think I kind of grew um, instead of like being stuck in that mentality of like, oh, I don't have anybody. I grew and then I kept learning um, along the way stuff that, you know, probably other people, you know, with parents who go to college might have told them like I kind of learned the hard way and it's it's been challenging, but still it's very rewarding when you have to like figure it out yourself and um yeah. Yes. Thank you for sharing that story with us. Yes. You didn't let the obstacles, you didn't let the challenges of being a first generation student. And I know those challenges firsthand. And um, you didn't let those challenges, you know, knock you down. You kept on going and pressing through. And that is an indication of some growth mindset. And you can cultivate that growth mindset even further. Anyone else willing to share in our last couple of minutes? I think adding on to Caroline's point, um, like it's, I think when you really reflect on it, you can see like you've had growth mindset a lot, whether it be like sports, trying like a new sport and then growing in it. Um, with the, like being a first generation college student, I just finished my first year and it's like 
true like when people tell you yeah like it's gonna be difficult like being the only person of color or being the only like woman in your class like you hearing it is different than experiencing it so coming to like a class where you see like you're the only person of color and the only woman in the class like or like only woman of color in the class um it's like it takes you like really have to like switch your mindset like have that growth mindset of like okay i know i'm the only one but like that can't stop me from participating in the class or um reaching out to the professor if i need help because it's like really intimidating so it takes a lot to like look past that because at the end of the day like you're still in that class like you have a spot like you deserve to be there just like everybody else and like you also have to like learn like everybody else and like take advantage of it all. So you can't- Yeah, and that's, thank you, Clarissa. And that's why I got back to the um, idea around, uh, started with soft skills because you just talked about persistence and motivation. And uh, those soft skills are key to having that growth mindset and not allowing, walking into the room and seeing that, man, I'm the only person of color in this room of 40, 40 individuals, um, I don't know if I want to deal with this. You know, having that growth mindset, you might not want to deal with it, but when you have that growth mindset and you want to persist and are motivated to succeed because you know that you got to take that class anyway to get your degree, you know, that's having that growth mindset and not letting obstacles, you see this as a challenge, but one that allows you to become stronger and grow as a result. So good example, thank you for sharing that. Anyone else or, oh, we're at time. So Isabel is, uh, Isabel is gonna. Yeah, um, yeah, but anyone else has any final thoughts, comments, story? Um, Welcome you. I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. So like for growth mindset and fixed mindset, where do you like draw the line with having a growth mindset and then also being like realistic? So can you be like realistic and have a growth mindset or is that just, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Um, I think you can be realistic and have a growth mindset. You can definitely be, um, understand that there's only so much I can do, um, you know, or understand that, you know, there are certain rules and parameters to me getting in this class or going to this school or getting this financial aid to be able to go to this school. So you can be realistic, yes. But then you say, the growth mindset might say, okay, so I don't have the money to go to school this year. Um, and I've got to pay tuition. However, let me see what I can do over the next year to get the funds that I need to go to school and work through the obstacles that are in front of me. So you can definitely be realistic, but you can also try to persist. And that's just one example. Um, but within your within your realism, you can work to incorporate um, ways to overcome obstacles, to um, push back against certain challenges and continue to grow as a result. So you can do both. <clears throat> and if anything, the growth mindset might say, um, what is it about this realistic situation that I can work through to get to where I wanna go? Does that make sense? I think Anaya froze. Does yes, that make sense? Yes. Yeah, that okay. makes sense. I commend you all for, uh, it's, I feel like it's late because I'm old, but uh, <laughs> I commend you all. I commend you all for uh, doing this uh, scholar retreat at almost eight o'clock on Thursday evening, so. Yeah. And shout out to you too. We really appreciate taking your time. It's it's dinner hour. So thank you for taking some time out your day to, to spend it with CDI and our students and just sharing your knowledge um, and answering these questions so we can get on the right track, especially for the start of a school year. We're about to go back to school. We kind of got to get back into that mindset um, and know that, you know, this is a community for you and, you know, you'll have people rooting for you along the way. So. On that note, thank you so much, Dr. Brian Bridges. Virtual round of applause to you. Um, I appreciate you ending our scholar summit. Um, and I'm just going to go through some quick reminders for scholars. So, okay. so thank you all for having support. me. And uh, you all continue to have a good rest of your, of your summer. 
and uh, good luck in the fall semester. Awesome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Yep. Thank you.